so <coughs> in the last class we were discussing a very important point which the author gaudapada tries to drive home <coughs> his theory is the essential the fundamental nature of a thing never changes that is his theory now how does it relate to the fundamental doctrine of non origination which he ex- expounds in this book as i said earlier the doctrine of non origination or the theory that a world as such doesn't originate and remain imperfect and then go back to perfection this doctrine is not acceptable the world that we live in the world of plurality of changes and fluctuations when looked upon from the standpoint of the absolute reality is brahman itself in other way in other words this plurality this dualistic world is seen to be dualistic or imperfect because of its association with names and forms names and forms are not permanent as i said in the last class see if you if you make different pots and pans and vessels from clay the clay assumes different forms and depending upon the form we give them different names it's called nama and rupa in sanskrit names and forms but the moment we break those those clay vessels pots and pans they go back to clay so before they were produced they were clay when we break them they become clay they return to clay so when they sit in front of us as pots and pans then also they are not different from clay they are clay only clay in association or mud mud cup in the in the context of mud cup or maybe in the context of golden necklaces golden ornaments when we see this golden ornaments we are seeing nothing but gold in association with names and forms and names and forms are impermanent relative changing compared to its original status which is gold which is its original ontological status of reality in other words suppose we believe well in fact we can go back to perfection we can get liberation we can go to heaven we can get uh, nirvana or we can get liberation or we can get admission to god special heavens and so on but right now we are in a state of imperfection now we are in a state of imperfection we are sinners we have done many wrong things so perfection is a state that we have yet to achieve right now we are not perfect this is the doctrine of many of the monotheistic religious traditions gaudapada says we are not sinners we are not bound we are not in need of liberation not in need of liberation we are already liber- liberated we are essentially perfect we are consciousness we are the supreme reality the world itself when seen devoid of its association with names and forms is brahman itself that means the world has not become separated from brahman world is brahman itself just as a golden necklace that we are wearing in our neck or a earring that we wear or a mud cup 
with which we drink water is not different from mud even when we use it for drinking water and also this golden ornaments are not different from gold even when we uh, use it as an ornament similarly the world is it's by its very nature perfect only we must be able to look upon the world beyond the relativity beyond the association with names and forms so what is the world world is nothing but supreme consciousness or atman seen through the prism of relativity relativity technically means a complex consisting of three dimensions time space and causation these are all interrelated time space and causation these three components constitute what we call relativity in philosophy so if we can look upon this world beyond its association with names and forms which are after all the essence of relativity then we can live in this world and feel ourselves perfect this is in that's why in vedanta this is called the doctrine of jeevan mukta vedanta makes a very interesting statement and swami vivekananda when he came to this country 120 years back when he made this statement it was a bit of a people may have mistaken him mistaken those statements to be blasphemous or sacrilegious he said you too can become buddha and jesus there have been saints and sages in the past you too should and could become saints and sages that means this perfection this spiritual realization is a common property of everyone a kind of universalization of the idea of liberation so i mean we can that said anybody who feels that um not this psychophysical mechanism within me there is the ever pure the eternal atman the supreme consciousness which is immanent in all beings which is also omnipresent and which is also the transcendental reality if this realization comes we all become saints and sages and not only we can become he can means i mean we are capable of becoming we should try to become and that is the goal of human existence that's what swami vivekananda said that means the line of demarcation between the great and small vanishes we all have the potential to realize this immanent divinity that's why so vivekananda defined religion as the manifestation of divinity already in man divinity doesn't come from outside divinity is not a gift of god something very interesting a bit it may look a bit sacrilegious and blasphemous in a tradition which may perhaps see a clear demarcation between god sitting above and we helpless human beings suffering in this world but vivekananda said we all can and we all have the potential to become divine in fact manifestation of this inner divinity is the goal it ought to be the goal of every living being in this world so he underlines the word already in man man means more men and women that's what he meant all human beings so this divine principle is, is already within us and everybody should try to manifest this by practicing unselfishness love and compassion and broad mindedness towards all human beings because the realization of this immanent divine principle within has a great ethical and moral import and significance it makes us better human beings in fact one indication of spirituality according to swami vivekananda is broad mindedness spirituality is a very abstract concept we don't know what spirituality is we may argue but we know what it is not that's the idea 
if you see a demarcation if you if you if you we may have to practice wisdom and common sense while living this world you know we cannot if ice and if water and heat we may have to be careful while interacting with those things but the point is fundamentally we must realize that the divine principle is omnipresent and uh, immanent this reality so this is his original nature now godapada in this text says this original nature which he calls prakriti prakriti is the term that he calls it its original nature prakarshena kriyate iti prakriti that means it's anything which is its original nature godapada divides in fact he analyzes this idea of original original nature from four different angles i already explained in fact he is referring to ordinary empirical things uh, to illustrate the point that that anything which has got a definite nature will retain its original nature it will never be lost normally he say he, of course you have to remember godapada wrote this work around 5th or 6th century ad so he takes examples and illustrations from the cultural and philosophical ethos and milieu which were prevalent during those times so he says in the ninth verse samsiddhiki swabhavihi sahaja akrta chaya prakriti sedhi vigneya subhavam na jahatiya so what is prakriti that's what is uh, defining here what what prakriti saavikneya that is to be understood as prakriti as samsiddhiki samsiddhiki before exam as i say explain last time through yogic practices people great spiritual seekers may attain spe- certain special powers is called ashtanga yoga ashtanga ashta siddhi eight Um, special divine faculties they are mentioned in anima garima laghima mahima uh, prapti prakamyam ishitum vasitum they all are certain char- special skills they are not necessarily spiritual in nature they are not necessarily spiritual in nature they are certain special mental faculties that people uh, realize people uh, achieve through constant practices you can find such special skills even at the physical level well the, uh, a person who covers 100 meters in 8.9 seconds or less than 9 seconds in olympics 100 meters race is a special skill he has got and if that's that kind of skill is a purely physical skill but these are subtle mental skills which remain intact physical skills one may lose in course of time through non practice but uh, mental skills certain abstract s- subtle skills will remain intact so one skill is samsiddhiki which he calls which is special faculties and skills that people achieve through practice of certain yogic meditation the next category is uh, we see for example uh, see intrinsic see for example <clears throat> uh, uh, certain characteristics uh, see for example heat and fire light and fire now heat and light are the natural characteristics of fire this is an example you can never think of heat sorry you can never think of fire without thinking of heat and light at least something one of these modern you may, may you may have an electric machine something heat we may be hot but may not give light but anyway they just got heat after all so if there is heat there is the presence of fire that's the idea behind you that means fire will never lose its intrinsic faculty of heat will remain intact then the third uh, characteristic is inborn 
capacity. For example, birds can fly. Or oh, certain animals can run very fast. Such skills. And the fourth one is akrda, means which is not caused by any external factor, caused by the thing itself. For example, water. Water has a, a natural, built-in, inherent uh, nature of flowing. If it doesn't flow, it's not water. You cannot think of water without its natural characteristic of flowing. Now, these are the skills, these are the special skills which remain intact. So, Gaudapada is here referring to ordinary natural phenomena to illustrate the point that their built-in intrinsic characteristics are never lost. Now, he says, then what to think of the real nature of Atman, Brahman, Supreme Consciousness? It can never be born because it's eternal. Birth, as I said in the last many classes, birth is nothing but a change. A change or a transition from a state of non-existence to a state of existence. That's what we normally understand by the word birth. Atman is ajam. Ajam in Sanskrit means unborn. And because it is unborn, for the reason that it is eternal, it is deathless, it is immortal. Now, if water cannot lose its special faculty of flowing, water is an empirical thing, then how can Atman lose its special characteristic of being eternal, unborn, deathless, and immortal, then how can you ever say that this Atman takes the birth as this imperfect world, or this world is born from Atman, and then remains in a state of imperfection? So, even when we think we are these bodies, we are not these bodies, we are the Atman. As I said last time, the fact that we are the Atman doesn't depend upon our realization that we are the Atman. Even if we believe strongly that we are just these physical bodies, we will not be just the physical bodies, we will be Atman. Only if you don't realize it. The difference is, so the, the difference between a Buddha or a Jesus or a Shankara or a Ramakrishna Paramahamsa or any of the great spiritual persons and common people is this. They realize it, we do not realize it. Not that we are all physical bodies, that they are all Atman, no. They realize their divine nature. They get rid of the wrong notion that they are just these physical bodies. And common people are not, common people who are not interested in these subjects, they do not really want to get rid of the wrong notion that they are these physical bodies. So, there again a matter of realization. Realization doesn't bring about a radical change. It only removes the wrong notion that we entertain that we are these bodies. So, Atmanhood, though the fact that we are Atman, is not a knowledge that we get. It is not something that we attain. When we realize we are the Atman, we do not get a new knowledge that we are the Atman. We lose the wrong notion that we are this body. That's what is happening. We lose the wrong notion that we are this body or mind or anything. We don't get the right notion we are the Atman because that is not something which comes. It is not a knowledge that comes. As I said last time, in a dark room, if there is a robe lying on the table, when you bring light, before you brought light, you may have thought the rope is a snake, a sti stick or a stream of thin water or a crack on the floor. These are the four illustrations that you find in Vedantic texts. Sarpa, Jaladha, Jaladhara, Danta, and Bhuchidra. A crack on the floor. You may mistake the piece of rope for a crack on the floor. You may mistake it for a stick or maybe for a snake or for a thin stream of water because of its shape. When you bring light, you are not producing rope. 
What is happening? You are not even getting the right knowledge that it is rope. What is happening? You are losing the wrong knowledge that it is a snake. That's what is happening. The right knowledge that it is a rope is intrinsic. It is natural. It doesn't come from the light. What is happening is when darkness is removed, then what is left is light. So the function of a of a electric torch is not to give light but to remove darkness because what we call light is nothing but the absence of darkness what we call darkness is nothing but the absence of light so what we call bondage in our life is only the wrong notion that we are these bodies which is nothing but the absence of the right notion that we are the atman so it may, you may it may look a bit uh, Uh, you know the high, these highly involved arguments are found in in the great dialectician the great um, metaphysician shankaracharya's commentary i am just reproducing a bit of this as a kind of intellectual game you know <laughs> just a bit of it and now we will come to a very interesting verse which is uh, which is something uh <coughs> of course uh, we will be going to the 11th and 12th verse today 11th verse will introduce us to a very interesting topic the philosophy of sankhya sankhya school of philosophy which is a very important and very ancient system of thought that was very prominent in india almost uh, from 1500s bc onwards so influence of the sankhya system of philosophy can be found in the ancient uh sophists in greek and even the works of uh the pre socrates philosophers like thales you find thales who believe the water is the one foundational principle out of which the entire universe is produced so sankhya philosophy is referred to in the 11th verse i shall just explain I shall give just like an outline of Sankhya system of philosophy, and then it will be interesting to know. So, Sankhya system of philosophy is attributed to the great sages of ancient India who lived around 16 or 17th century BC. His name is Kapila. The name occurs in many of the old ancient mythological works. and how prominent and how widespread this philosophy was as you, it is said that even when alexander came right to the west north western borders of india in 327 bc he came across many sankhya philosophers he invited them to macedonia and that was the beginning of the active interaction between ancient greek thinkers and uh, the great sankhya philosophers of north western india not just in india today of not today in those days we afghanistan pakistan punjab all these regions were parts of not just in india at that time and in the 5th century ad a great indian philosopher his name was paramartha translated this book into chinese language and he took it to china and spread this philosophy in the 5th century ad because 200 years earlier before i mean 200 year uh, 200 two centuries before this great philosopher uh, translated this work into chinese and took to china a well known book that that we study today uh, was composed in sankhya philosophy the new sankhya kariga which has got 70 stanzas 70 verses stanzas not, ne- not necessarily in metrical form the name of the work is sankhya karika which consists of 70 stanzas that's why uh, paramartha that is the name of the great monk who took this to china it is said that he was a buddhist monk who translated the sankhya karika into chinese and he gave the chinese title which english may read the golden 70 discourse it's a 
That's how that tra ch Chinese translation was later translated in English. I mean, the golden Chinese disco, golden 70 discourse, because it consists of 70 verses. Now, according to Sankhya system, there are two ultimate entities. One is a conscious reality. The other is an unconscious reality. The conscious reality is called Purusha and the unconscious reality, unconscious principle, entity, is called Prakriti. Sometimes it's called Prathanam. It's called. And according to them, the entire universe, including time and space, are evolutes of this Prakriti. That's a very interesting doctrine peculiar to Sankhyas because they believe not only the matter and the physical universe, but even time and space are also evolutes of Pradhanam of Prakriti. So you have to remember there are two fundamental entities, absolute entities. One is Purusha, which is conscious. In Sanskrit, it's called Sachetana, means endure with consciousness. Or Prakriti, which is Jada, which is unconscious. Purusha doesn't play any role in the creation of this universe. But the entire universe is nothing but an evolute of this Prakriti. So it is a pluralistic system. So it is somewhat different from Vedanta. Because Gaudapada is trying to refer to this system of philosophy in the next verse, in the 11th verse only to show its inconsistencies. His, Godabada's central theme is the real correct approach is Advaita, non-dualistic system, which teaches that the reality is one and that is one all-pervading consciousness, omnipresent reality, which is present in all beings, it is omnipresent and also immanent, which is the only eternal reality, Atman or Brahman. That is Gaudabada's philosophy. And it is beyond names, forms, attributes, time, space, causation and everything. It is the only absolute reality the reality beyond the relative. Everything else is relative. Now, in Gaudabada's scheme, he wants to um, he wants to show the logical uh, fineness, the logical foundation of non-dualistic system. Now, he doesn't contain other system. In fact, to prove the the, the uniqueness of non-dualistic system, he reveals, he refers to some of the incon in inconsistencies, inadequacies of all dualistic, pluralistic system, which says that God created this world, that we are all imperfect, that this world, that everything in this world is different from one another. These are some of the some of the doc doctrines of all dualistic philosophers. Of course, all of them do not believe in a creative God. That's different. But still, plurality, plurality and dualism, the idea of separateness, the idea of disunity, the idea of distinction and differences always brings problems, ethical problem, philosophical problem and spiritual problem. The idea of unity the idea of oneness, the idea that creation is one, human, the human society is one, existence is one, this gives us tremendous strength. And that, one, that sense of oneness makes us feel that we are actually not these physical bodies which come and go, but we are the immortal, eternal Atman. To drive home this idea, he brings out the different systems of thought which were prevalent during his time, in fact, much before he was born, these systems were prevalent, in only to show at the logical level, at the metaphysical level, epistemological level, 
the uniqueness of non-dualistic system. So to understand 11th verse, we should know something about the first system that he refers to, that is Sankhya. So as I said, Sankhya philosophy believes that there are two ultimate entities. One is Purusha, which is pluralistic, because every individual has its own Purusha, but it's only one reality. The other is Prakriti. Purusha is conscious, Prakriti is unconscious. From this unconscious Prakriti, the entire universe evolves. So one question which non-dualistic philosophers put before them is, how can an unconscious entity become the source of creation? How can something which is essentially unconscious, like this Prakriti or Prathana of Sankhyas, how can it be the source of evolution? Okay, that's a question which they could not possibly answer. But, of course, we, before going to that, I shall give just a brief outline of the Sankhya scheme of evolution. So, Pradhanam of Prakriti is the source of evolution. From Prakriti, first, the cosmic intellect emerges. This cosmic intellect they call Mahat. That's a Sanskrit term because when you read any technical book on Indian philosophy or even West, Western interpreters, Western thinkers also have translated many of these books into English in modern times. They may use this term within brackets, the Mahat, which means cosmic intelligence, cosmic intellect. Out of cosmic intellect, the feeling, the ego feeling comes, uh -huh, I mean I, this I consciousness emerges. And this ego consciousness, ego ideal has got three dimensions. One is pure, which is called sattvika. The other is rajasika, more active. The third one is inactive, which is relatively devoid of any consciousness. From its higher sattvika element of ego, me, aham, a, a, ahamkara, it's called ahamkara, mind evolves, so mind is made of subtle, mind is much more subtle than senses of perception or senses of action of the universe. Mind is much more subtle because mind can dictate terms to your five senses of perception like ears, eyes, and also your other uh, motor organs. Mind is the master of all the ten senses, senses of perception and senses of action. So mind is made of subtle elements. So it comes out of the subtle sattvic aspect of ahankara, ego. Then the five senses of uh, perception, sensory organs, they come from the digestic, the active element of this ego system and then the f the abstract five elements come out of the tamasika or the what do you comparatively inferior we don't call it inferior tamasika means which is not devoid of any consciousness mind is much more subtle senses of action and senses of perception are less subtle, but they are much more subtle than the physical universe, the empirical universe. Because we, we, can, uh, we can conquer the external world with the help of mind and the five uh, sensory organs and the five motor organs. So the physical universe comes out of the five abstract principles, which also emerge from the Tamasiga dimension of Ahankara and from the abstract elements with Panja Tanmatras, the Panja Mahabhudas evolve. Panja Mahabhudas are five fundamental elements air, water, uh, uh, space, and so on. Now, this is the Sankhya view, which means ultimately there are 25 principles which constitute the universe. So, 
Vedanta agrees some aspects of Sankhya philosophy, but not its conclusion. Some aspects. For example, the mind is much more subtle than the five sensor, sensory organs and five motor organs. These ideas are naturally understandable. And these five sensory organs attract the mind towards external objects. All these ideas are perfectly acceptable even to Vedantis. This is, in short, the Sankhya philosophy. It is an essentially pluralistic system. Uh, some of the older Sankhya philosophers did not posit a creator god. They did not believe in a transcendental moral authority. They were not materialists, but they did not subscribe and they did not endorse the view of a creator god. So it was not a monotheistic system. It was essentially a dualistic, pluralistic system. But some of the later Sankhya philosophers did accept uh, some kind of a divine principle in the name of a god. So this much, this you have to remember. So, as I said last time, the Sankhya philosophers believed that Prakriti undergoes real change and becomes the universe. Now, they also believed that this universe is already involved in Prakriti or Prathana. They believed that the universe exists as an in, in its involved form in his involved condition in the Prakriti. Just as a mighty tree may be existing in an involved form in a seed. If you ask the question, where does a tree come from? Not from the water that you pour under the plant, not the manure or the air and water. These are conditions which are necessary. Not only that, that there is, an in, there, is a, there is an inseparable connection between the nature of the tree that grows and the kind of seed that you are planting. So mango tree, mango seed only can produce a mango tree. What does it mean? That particular tree was already existing in the seed in, uh, in subtle form. So mango tree is nothing but banyan tree, any tree for that matter. You can redwood tree, anything you may call. The tree is nothing but the gross manifestation of the seed, which means the tree existed in a subtle form within the seed. That is their theory. So effect pre-exists in cause. Effect is nothing but the result of the cause really becoming the effect. So it is real change. As I called last time, we called Parinama Vata. Last time we described this in detail. This particular aspect we described, Parinama. Well, it means real change, not apparent change. Like milk becoming yogurt or curds, anything you call it. Or the seed becoming the oil. How do we know that it's a real change? Yogurt cannot go back to its milk form. Or the oil cannot go back to its seed form. So they believe in the transformation, the real transformation of the cause into effect. So they believe the entire universe is nothing but result of the gradual process of evolution. First, Mahat, which is called the cosmic intelligence or intellect. From that, Ahankara comes, egocentrism. From its subtle, sattvic aspect, mind. From its Rajasiga active, dynamic element, emerge the five senses of perception and five senses of action from its tamasiga or uh, rather dull dimension emerges the abstract five elements the subtle five elements and from the subtle five elements the gross five elements which constitute the universe emerge. this is the theory this is called 24 principles are included this idea behind it now their theory in some ways, it appears to be very scientific and rational. But if you look at it from another angle, there is an element of, uh, I mean, there is something illogical, essentially illogical about it. First, the first argument 
that non dualistic philosophers point out is how can this prakriti which is which you call which you consider to be unconscious how can it be the cause of creation change always indicates the presence of something within it which is which not really dead a stone doesn't evolve into a bigger stone but a seed evolves into a plant so there is something in the seed which becomes a plant so you can't say if you say the evolution is real then you can't say prakriti is unconscious so these are the some of the incon- inconsistencies in that view now this is one view gaudapada is referring to another school of philosophers and the two schools of philosophers whose views are somewhat identical i already referred last time to these philosophers one is the indian school of atomism which is called vaisheshika philosophy which is attributed to kanada the great thinker who believed in a plurality of subtle elements atom atomic particles which constitute this universe now before proceeding further i would like to point out one important difference you know you may some of us may feel why should these non dualistic philosophers uh, argue go go for a quarrel with these people for that historically you have to ask godapada but godapada had inner enough reason for this the historical reason was the sankhya philosophers ultimately were trying to propound a theory but there was no place for anything permanent anything ever pure or immortal their theory would have become something like accidentalism what is called accidentalism is a that theory that theory sometimes uh, by it is it is um accepted by many modern physicists if you ask the question why is this world what it is well if you cannot think beyond the world then you if you cannot think of a god then you have to they will, they will you have to say it just it is so that's all so recently a great thinker pointed out one uh, paragraph in in a well known book written by a great scientist of our times who is also one of the most renowned humanist and also atheist in the world he is a great humanist but also atheist so in that book there is a beautiful description of the universe the galaxies the stars the milky way the clouds and that he po- he gave this graphic description just to say that these things are purely by accident his aim was to prove that there is no god behind any of this there is no transcendental intelligence a god behind all this. he was only eager to deny the, any role for god that's all but at the same time he was describing the beauty what he himself called the many layered sublimity of the universe so somebody raised the question when we read your passage of describing the world we don't feel it is the is a totally unattached a dry uh, in the, uh, i mean intellectual uh, description of a dead universe you are at you are in love with this nature unless you enjoy unless you see something sublime and beautiful and grand and purely transcendental you won't be able to see you won't be able to describe this universe the way you have described it so he says even in the description of the universe in which you try to prove rather disprove the existence of god there was a the beauty and charm of godliness that is working through your mind so the words the word the way in which he described the so called non existent uh, i mean the so called 
uh, non-divine, unconscious world, without a God behind, without a transcendental intelligence behind, even that description is not different from some of the Psalms in the Bible, some of the great hymns of the Vedas. That was the answer I gave. So how could you do that? So where does this beauty, this ability to see something sublime in this dead universe, where does it come from? It doesn't come from a dry intellect. It comes from something that is, some, that is conscious, something that goes beyond matter, something that goes beyond dry analytical power. And that is our God. That is the gift of God. That is the answer given by a theist. I'm just giving an example. So you now Sankhya's problem is they try to describe the world and in the process they also talk about mind which can perceive the universe and at the same time they say this mind is nothing but an evolute of a dead matter. What is a dead matter? Prakriti. So non dualists say an unconscious dead matter cannot create a mind we can see beauty and sublimity in the universe. We can meditate and think beyond. So their theory that the entire universe, including human beings, including their minds and intellect, are nothing but evolutes of dead matter is totally unacceptable. This is a one, one of the arguments which Shankaracharya puts forward in his Brahma Sutra Bhashya. We don't have time to go through it. Shankaracharya, the great uh, Advaita philosopher, takes pains. He writes long passages in refuting the theory the entire universe is nothing but a, but a, but an evolute of a dead matter, dead substance, which the Sankhya philosophers call Prakriti. That's the idea there. Now, here, Godapada says, Kairanam yesse vai kairyam, Kairanam tasse jayate, Jayamanam katham ajam bhinnam nityam katham chatat. The prose order is, Yesya kairanam vai, Kairyam tasya, Kairanam jayate, Jayamanam katham ajam bhinnam tad katham eva nityam. Now, as I said last time in the class, in the, when I described this, Parinama Vada, which is one of the two main streams of uh, Satkarya Vada. I already explained in the last class. First, you have to keep in our mind two broad streams of thought. One, one is Satkarya Vada, which says the effect pre exists in cause. The other is Asatkarya Vada, which says the effect is an entirely new creation. That view is held by in the Indian atomists, we call Vaisheshikas, and also the, the great philosophers of Indian logic called Nayayikas. Now, the Sankhyas belong to the first school, I mean Satkaryavada, who believe that effect pre-exists in cause. But they also say the cause becomes the effect. It is a real change. Non-dualists or Advedins also believe that the effect pre-exists in cause. The difference is that non-dualists or Advedins argue that the cause does not really become the effect. The change is only apparent. Change is not real. The example is, for example, the the rope appearing to be the snake. When you bring light, you understand the rope for what it is. The rope does not really become the snake. Like milk becoming yogurt. So, that's the view. So, as I said, Advedins believe that we wrongly believe that this Brahman has become the universe. The universe, the world in which we are living with all created beings, are themselves non different from Brahman Supreme Consciousness. If we can look upon them without any association of name and form, then we can see 
the real Atman everywhere. If we can look upon ourselves, devoid of our wrong association with our actions, thoughts, and other psychophysical phenomena, then we can also realize that we are in reality that ever conscious immortal Atman, not this physical body. This is Advaitin view. Okay, Gaudapada is trying to ask a question to the Sankhya philosophers. If you argue that the cause itself becomes the effect, then what does it mean? That cause is born as effect. You also say that the effect and cause are the same because they, they believe the effect pre-exists in cause. They believe the cause and effect are the same. At the same time, they also argue that cause becomes the effect. If effect and cause are the same, and if you also argue that cause becomes the effect, then how is, how is it acceptable? It is not acceptable. Now, Shankaracharya is a bit of a humorist. He uh, somewhat makes fun of these people, and uh, it is something very interesting. His argument is this. If you say some part of effect, some part of cause remains immortal, unchanging, and another part of the cause becomes effect. It will be like things of the, suppose you, want, you have only one, say, uh, there is a theory, suppose you have only one hen, and you want to eat, and you also want that it should lay eggs tomorrow. So can you cut a hen into two, and eat one half, and can you keep the other half in the fridge expecting an egg that you lay eggs tomorrow? Shankaraja, this is Kukkudi Nyaya, Artha Kukkudi Nyaya. You remember these are old figures of speech used in Vedantic textbooks and also other books also. Kalidasa uses in a slightly different language. Now, Shankaraja asked the question, to argue that the effect pre-exists in cause, and effect and cause are the same. At the same time, the effect really transforms itself into, sorry, the cause itself becomes the effect. It will be say, it's like saying that you have only one egg. You cut it into two. The one half you eat it now. The other half you keep it for tomorrow, for laying eggs. This is a very... The logical, the Shankara statement is this, Nahi kukutya ekadesha pachyade ekadesha prasavaya kalpade. This means, prasavaya it may lay egg tomorrow. One half you cook now and eat, and the other one you lay for tomorrow's eggs. It may lay eggs, expecting. The reason is this, there is a way of, an ancient way of, there is a subtle humor behind it. Shankara's argument is something very funny and humorous. I shall try to drive home because those who are not familiar with Vedantic text may not be fully able to appreciate. And if you if you speak of such a great humorous point and the whole audience remains grim and serious, then that means it's a pity that you know, Shankara would have, we feel pity on all of us. We are not able to appreciate the sense of humor behind it. So I shall try to explain once more. The idea is this. Sankhya's believe that the effect pre-existing cause. Cause is Prakriti. Effect is this universe. But they also believe that the effect and cause are the same. Because if the effect pre-existing pre-existing cause and if they are the same and if you also argue the cause becomes really becomes the effect then it will be like saying one hen can be cooked into two, should be cut into two, one half could be re put in the refrigerator expecting that, it will, that half, the cut, the half of the egg will lay eggs and you can eat the eggs tomorrow, the other half you eat it now. Because the Sankhya's argue one aspect of the cause 
will become the effect. The other aspect remains as cause itself. So this is totally unacceptable. Why the point is, non-dualists believe this change is not real, only apparent. That is logical. It's something like saying, you know, the rope appears to be the snake. So if the change is real, the argument becomes logical. If the change is said to be apparent only, then argument is perfectly logical. Advedins argue that the change is only apparent, not real. Sankhyas argue that change is real. So that is the idea behind this. Now the purpose behind is to prove the inconsistency of the logic behind uh, Sankhya's view. Then there is the other view. I think we have just finished time. I shall try to explain the views of Indian atomists by Seshigas and the Indian logicians, the Nayayagas, in the next class. These, because they belong to the opposite camp and because they believe that everything that we find in this world is a new creation. As I said last time, they believe, the Yaigas believe that the clothes that you're wearing, the shirt, or the shirt that you're wearing has no relation at all with the threads out of which the cloth is made. It is something as ridiculous as saying that the mud cup with which you drink water has nothing to do with the mud out of which it is made. Their argument is, you don't drink water with mud. You drink only water. You can only drink water with a cup that is made of mud. So there is a difference with regard to utility. And you get a different name. You call it cup. You don't call it mud. So there is a difference in utility, in name and ordinary uh, practices, numbers. One, uh, one mud cup it may be made of different particles of clay or mud. So there is difference with regard to number, utility, and also outlook, practical utility. So they believe everything in this world is a new creation. It has no connection at all with its material cause. Material cause means mud is a material cause of a cup made of mud. Golden ornament is the effect Gold is a material cause. Goldsmith is the efficient cause. The machines that you use are secondary causes. Like that. So we'll continue the discussion next class. Thank you. Namaskar. Om Shanti Shanti.